social media presence as noted here. Um, we have partnered with the CDC Public Health Library and Information Center to feature scientific articles about this month's Grand Rounds topic, Injection Safety. The articles listed here are a sampling of this month's selections. The full listing is available at cdc.gov slash science clips or via electronic subscription. Today's speakers include Dr. Joseph Purs from CDC, Dr. Gus Burkhead from the New York State Department of Health, and Dr. Thomas Hamilton from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dr. Michael Bell, the Associate Director for Infection Control from CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion, will serve as our closing speaker and discussion leader today. We're putting on this Grand Rounds at a time of extraordinary dedication and effort by our speakers, their colleagues, and the entire public health community in responding to multiple uh, complex health emergencies. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize and thank all of their leadership and service. Prior to commencing our session, we will hear introductory remarks from the CDC director, Dr. Thomas Frieden. Over the past few months, more than 400 people in this country have contracted life-threatening fungal meningitis from unsafe injections. Healthcare should never spread bloodborne pathogens or contaminants. CDC's one and only campaign, which you'll hear more about today, raises awareness among patients and helps improve practices of healthcare providers. We can protect patient safety by establishing and effectively enforcing evidence-based standards. Individuals, healthcare systems, and government agencies have done a lot to improve injection safety, but more progress is needed. I've always thought that do no harm was far too low a bar to aim for, but it's one that we should definitely achieve. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Joe Purse. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to present and discuss on the topic of injections without infections. I hope you'll all agree that this represents an essential and basic form of patient safety. Injections and infusions represent the most common invasive procedure across all healthcare. Examples include chemotherapy, intravenous antibiotics, vaccination, sedation anesthesia, joint injections, injections given as part of cosmetic or alternative medicine procedures, and so on. Because these are invasive procedures, they pose a risk of infection and basic protections must be in place to assure their safety. To put this afternoon's presentations in perspective, Let's review the broader context. Safe injections require that we have sound systems that support safe production of sterile medications. Safe preparation of the appropriate medication, which is typically drawn up in a syringe. Safe administration of the medication in a manner that maintains sterility and minimizes risk of infection, ending with safe disposal. As noted on this slide, healthcare worker safety is one important dimension of safe injection practice. Likewise, considering the production and preparation stages, safe manufacturing and pharmacy practices are essential, as every injection must begin with sterile product. Today's public health grand rounds will focus on the patient risks and clinical practices at the point injections are administered. As I'll describe later, safe administration depends on adherence to safe practices as outlined in CDC's evidence-based standard precautions. Traditionally, injection safety was recognized as a public health issue mainly in low and middle income countries. Estimates of the global burden of disease associated with unsafe injections in the year 2000 included more than 20 million new hepatitis B virus infections, more than 20 million new hepatitis C virus infections, and more than 250,000 HIV infections. Reuse of injection equipment, as illustrated in this photo, taken some years ago in South Asia, drove much of this transmission. 
Note that the CDC supported the establishment of the World Health Organization's Safe Injection Global Network in the 1990s, with much progress having been made since that time. Outbreaks investigated by CDC and state and local health departments have helped, have helped illustrate the point that our U.S. healthcare system is not immune to the dangers of unsafe injections. This slide shows the mechanism by which hepatitis C virus infections were transmitted in a 2008 Las Vegas, Nevada outbreak. This was a busy endoscopy clinic that used a short-acting sedative, propofol, which is supplied in single-dose vials. As shown on the left, at the start of the procedure, a new clean needle and syringe were used to draw up medication. When used on an HCV-infected patient, backflow contaminated the syringe. Patients typically required additional medication to maintain sedation. Nurses in this clinic reused the patient's syringe, as shown here in the circle, to draw the medication. After replacing the needle, by putting the reused syringe in contact with the vial, contamination was transferred to the vial. This clinic routinely reused these single-dose vials for multiple patients, which established a pathway for the spread of hepatitis C from one patient to another, as shown on the right. Changing the needle in this situation did not prevent contamination of the vial. It did, however, expose the nurse to risk of Sharpe's injury and occupational disease transmission. This outbreak was identified by the local health department, which initially received two reports of acute hepatitis C and determined the patients shared a common exposure to this endoscopy clinic, which, as we learned later, was a CMS-certified ambulatory surgical center. Investigation uncovered this unsafe injection practices and confirmed six additional cases of transmission. However, the impact extended well beyond these eight infected patients. Since reuse of syringes and single-dose vials was routine in this clinic, many patients were potentially exposed to unsafe practices that put them at risk for serious blood-borne pathogen infections such as hepatitis C, which is typically a silent infection. This invokes the public health ethics principle of duty to warn Ultimately, over 50,000 patients were notified by public health authorities of their potential exposure and advised to seek testing. This outbreak was also significant in that it led to collaborations with CMS, which you'll hear about more later in the hour. To summarize then, unsafe injection practices can be thought of as falling into two intersecting categories, reuse of syringes and mishandling of medications. We do still encounter direct reuse in which a single syringe is used for more than one patient. Sometimes healthcare providers have the mistaken belief that injecting through a length of IV tubing is a safe practice or removing the needle makes the syringe safe for reuse. Insulin uh, pens are an example of a newer type of device that integrates a pre-filled syringe. And while these are approved for single patient use only, some providers believe that changing the needle makes them safe to use for multiple patients. Narcotics tampering by addicted healthcare providers has also emerged as an issue and resulted in exposure of patients to reused contaminated syringes. More commonly though, we encounter indirect syringe reuse when we investigate outbreaks. This has been labeled as double dipping and was uh, illustrated in the Nevada example I shared a few minutes ago. Mishandling and, and inappropriate sharing of medication containers includes contamination from double dipping as well as reuse of single dose vials to obtain medication for multiple patients. Because single dose vials typically lack preservatives, this practice carries substantial risks for bacterial contamination, growth, and spread of infection. Similarly, intravenous solution bags are often mishandled, for example, when used as a common source of supply for multiple patients. The U.S. experience with outbreaks due to unsafe injection practices has grown substantially over recent years. Since 2001, at least 48 outbreaks were, have occurred that CDC is aware of. Bear in mind that all these outbreaks were due to extrinsic contamination at the point of preparation and administration. In other words, not from intrinsically contaminated products received from a pharmacy or drug company. 21 of these outbreaks involved transmission of hepatitis B or hepatitis C. 
The other 27 represented outbreaks of bacterial infections, most of which involved invasive bloodstream infection. 90% of the outbreaks identified here occurred in outpatient settings with an overrepresentation of pain clinics where injections are made into the spine and other sterile spaces using preservative-free medications. Cancer clinics are also overrepresented. These clinics care for vulnerable patients, many of whom are immune compromised, with many of the outbreaks having involved exposure to contaminated catheter flush solutions. And while hundreds of patients became infected in the outbreaks I just described, equally significant are the massive numbers, over 150,000 to date, who have required notification to advise bloodborne pathogen testing following potential exposures to unsafe injections. Note that the threshold for notification is not the presence of identified infections or confirmed transmission. While those conditions are often the signal that leads to identification of syringe reuse and related breaches, increasingly we are seeing notification events triggered by the discovery of syringe reuse itself. And it is important to remind ourselves that behind the statistics and headlines, there are real people, real lives that have been impacted and affected. At left, we have a patient who was potentially exposed as a result of narcotics tampering. At right, a non-outbreak situation involving reuse of influenza vaccine syringes. Obviously, receiving a notification letter is distressing and anxiety provoking for patients and their loved ones. It also involves significant costs related to follow-up testing and medical management, as well as a breach in trust. Unsafe injection practices are not limited to outbreaks or identified events. A recent survey of physicians and nurses illustrates the potential magnitude of the hidden risks. 1% admitted that they sometimes or always reuse a syringe on a second patient. 1% sometimes or always reused a would reuse a multi-dose vial for additional patients after accessing it with a used syringe. And 6% said that they use single-dose vials for more than one patient. It's difficult, of course, to know the true prevalence of unsafe practices since this was uh, a voluntary study which did not include medical assistance, other types of providers. And again, this was based on responses, which may be biased and not confirmed by observation. Nonetheless, one can appreciate the repercussions of this adherence gap in terms of background transmission. So having mentioned what I politely termed as an adherence gap, I'd like to briefly mention the one and only campaign. Our goal is to prevent outbreaks, infections, and the need for patient notification. We do not want any healthcare provider telling us they didn't know better when it comes to syringe reuse and other unsafe injection practices. The one and only campaign is led by the CDC and its partners in the Safe Injection Practices Coalition. Our ultimate goal is to ensure that patients, and that includes every one of us in this room, those viewing, our friends, neighbors, family members, that everyone is protected each and every time they receive a medical injection. As I indicated earlier, safe injection practices are a key component of CDC standard precautions guidance. Key elements include never administering medications from the same syringe to multiple patients, not reusing a syringe to enter a, to, reusing a syringe to enter a vial, and limiting sharing of medication vials among multiple patients. It is these standards that form the basis for our educational outreach and efforts to increase implementation and enforcement of safe injection practices. Which brings me to my final slide. Injection safety is a complex public health issue that requires a multidimensional approach, innovative solutions and partnerships. And I can offer at least three E's for ensuring safe injections. First, we rely on epidemiologic capacities related to surveillance, reporting, monitoring, and investigation. Second, we recognize the need for sound educational initiatives to promote understanding of safe injection practices and basic infection control. Recognizing that education is necessary but not always sufficient, we also rely on enforcement and oversight, that is, policies and mechanisms that support and ensure adherence to safe injection practices and other basic infection control. Being mindful of the need to extend this reach to all settings where injections are delivered. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Burkhead. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Joe, and thanks for inviting me to share our experiences in New York with injection-related outbreak investigations. In the next few slides, I will provide a brief overview of some investigations we have conducted. <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a cold here. Uh, and also summarize what New York has been doing to address this public health issue. This slide shows a number of investigations of known or potential bloodborne pathogen transmissions that the State Health Department has been involved in over the last decade. The predominant modes of exposure or transmission relate to poor injection practices or to dialysis. I will focus my remarks on poor injection practices and Mr. Hamilton will say a little bit more about dialysis in his talk. These 11 investigations involve notifications of almost 10,000 people. <clears throat> One of the first and the largest investigation we have been involved is involved in involved a pain management clinic. Uh, this outbreak investigation helped us develop the epi methods we have used in subsequent outbreaks and led us to develop a much more systematic approach to these investigations, which I will describe later. This investigation began <clears throat> similar to the, the uh, episode that Joe discussed when an astute county public health nurse conducting a routine hepatitis surveillance investigation identified two cases of acute hepatitis C infections in patients who received epidural injections during the same, uh, from the same physician uh, in a private pain management clinic. A site visit to the physician's practice was conducted to observe infection control practices. In the course of giving spinal injections, the physician was observed re-entering multi-dose vials of medication with a syringe already used to inject drugs through the indwelling spinal needle, having changed only the needle on the syringe to re-enter the vial. The contaminated vial was then put aside to be used for subsequent patients. The physician was not aware his practice presented an infection control risk, and he was immediately instructed to discontinue the practice. <clears throat> to confirm that transmission had indeed occurred in this practice and to identify other patients at risk, we conducted an active surveillance for other cases by first matching the patients, the practice's patient list against the state hepatitis C surveillance registry. An additional case of hepatitis C was identified by doing this. Next, we contacted 98 patients who received injections the week before, the week of, or the week after the three known cases. <coughs> Seven of those tested were positive for hepatitis C, a much higher prevalence than we had expected. And finally, transmission was confirmed in one instance by molecular testing in our state public health laboratory. The two patients had received pain, pain injections on the same day in the, in the clinic. With evidence of an infection control breach and disease transmission, we felt an obligation to notify other potentially exposed persons so they could seek testing for bloodborne pathogens. If infected, this would allow them to seek medical care for their own health and to reduce transmission to others. Patient notifications present a number of challenges, including how to select which patients to notify and balancing the message so as to impart factual information. <coughs> Excuse me and motivate people to seek testing without causing undue alarm. In this case, we also had challenges determining how to most efficiently get contact information from the provider's outdated electronic billing system. We initially notified 627 patients identified from the billing system who had spinal injections dating back to when the physicians started to practice at this site. However, due to publicity, <clears throat> when some patients gave notification letters to the press, we quickly learned of additional patients who had had spinal injections during the time frame but were not included in the list of patients provided by the practice. Therefore, the decision was made to notify all 8,532 patients in the practice's database, regardless of the time frame or type of procedure, and we also at this point issued our first press release. We also offered free testing for hepatitis B and C and HIV so there would be no barriers to people getting tested if they so wished. These investigations garner significant public health interest and press attention. As I mentioned, the original publicity around this investigation occurred when patients who received notification letters gave them to the press. <coughs> 
This resulted in a very difficult game of catch up to get our public health messages out. From this episode, we learned to be much more proactive in issuing press releases when doing large patient notifications. We also learned that these investigations can have significant ramifications for healthcare providers, patients, and public health agencies. <clears throat> In this case, the physician got substantial negative media attention, multiple lawsuits were filed against the individual, and conditions were placed on his medical license uh, for three years by our state uh, uh, professional conduct uh, office. Both the state and county health departments also received a great deal of media attention related to how the investigation was handled. Lawsuits were also filed related to the state's duty to inform patients sooner of potential infection risks and numerous freedom of information requests required expenditure of a great deal of resources in our department. Public attention to the out <coughs> two outbreak investigations may have unintended consequences, though the impact of these are not well understood. For example, publicity around such, such investigations may, may affect health-seeking behaviors. <coughs> For example, um, we've had an episode of reuse of uh, syringes for flu immunization, so that could have potentially affect health-seeking behaviors uh, <coughs> for recommended health services and screenings. Although we had no evidence that this occurred in this particular case, the issue has not been thoroughly studied and remains a potential concern. We've uh, acted on a number of the lessons that we learned from this investigation. First, we made changes in the public health law to strengthen the ability of the department to investigate and hold physicians accountable for, foreign, for poor infection control practices. <clears throat> we updated New York's mandatory infection control and barrier precautions training. Uh, and additionally, the Commissioner of Health formed a multidisciplinary group within the department to bring together all the affected program areas. And third, we embarked on a provider and public education effort as part of the one and only campaign, which has been mentioned already. <clears throat> Recently, New York has also increased regulation of ambulatory surgery, as Joe mentioned was the case in the, uh, the uh, endoscopy-related outbreak. Uh, this was not a direct result, but I think this investigation did, and, and a number of others, did contribute to the, us doing that in New York. So I'll address the first three points on this slide in a little more detail here. <clears throat> Due to the concern about HIV-infected healthcare workers in the 1990s, New York has a law requiring medical professionals to take an infection control and barrier precautions course every four years. As a result of this investigation, the curriculum of the mandated course was enhanced to include safe injection practices, as well as medical equipment cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. To improve coordination of investigations and communication within the health department on these issues, a multidisciplinary health care disease transmission workgroup was formed. The HDT workgroup includes representatives from epidemiology, laboratory, legal, public affairs, health care regulatory, and physician discipline offices in the department, each of which has a very distinct role to play in these investigations. The workgroup meets regularly to review active investigations to ensure consistent, coordinated, and timely response. <coughs> In the beginning, the workgroup developed guidelines for investigating reports of healthcare-associated blood-borne pathogen transmission. I'll show an example on this next slide. This is a table from the guidelines which we use to assure that we have a consistent approach as possible from investigation to investigation, given that each investigation is unique. The guidelines do indicate some circumstances, for example, in the upper right, where we will not investigate further, balancing the public health with the need to be efficient in the deployment of public health resources. So for example, in the upper right, single cases of hepatitis B or C while will generally not trigger further investigation if the patient has non-healthcare related exposures, such as injection drug use, or has multiple potential healthcare related exposures which would make an in-depth investigation logistically complex and less likely to lead to a definitive answer. A single case with only a single healthcare-related exposure uh, in the upper left will trigger an initial epi investigation to gather more facts to see if it is worth proceeding to a full investigation. Even if we don't follow up at this point, we keep these cases on monitor status and can reactivate a full investigation if more inf information becomes available or if another case occurs. At the other extreme, if we have multiple cases of hepatitis B or C 
with a single healthcare setting exposure in the lower left. Uh, we then embark on a full investigation. We have the flexibility, obviously, to deviate from these guidelines if circumstances dictate, but this table provides our general marching orders. When Nevada had one of the largest outbreaks of healthcare associated bloodborne notification a few years after ours, we provided technical assistance to them based on these guidelines that we use. <clears throat> As I mentioned, New York has embarked on a provider and public education campaign, part of the one and only campaign. <clears throat> the name is based on the principle that each needle and syringe should be used for one and only one injection. The one and only campaign is funded by the CDC and the Safe Injection Practices Coalition, a group of public health, corporate, and private stakeholders dedicated to safe injections. New York and Nevada were the two charter <clears throat> states in this uh, campaign. To guide our campaign, we have established a work group of external stakeholders, including 30 healthcare organizations, <clears throat> such as professional healthcare organizations, patient advocacy groups, and quality improvement organizations. With work group partners, we have given presentations to infection control practitioners across New York State and in other jurisdictions. We've presented to our State Board of Medicine to advocate for injection safety questions on national board exams and to malpractice carriers <clears throat> and large practices they insure. As a result, one large malpractice carrier has set up a collaborative committee to discuss implementation of the campaign messages and materials in its five New York City hospitals that it insures. And we have worked with other states to jointly develop a state local department toolkit to assist other health departments in getting into this area. This slide shows a number of the products of our New York one and only campaign. Uh, <clears throat> for healthcare providers in the upper left, uh, we focused, uh, had focus group tested educational materials to promote CDC's injection safety guidelines with the one needle, one syringe, one time message. These were mailed to all providers with required controlled substance prescription pads. To cover, to, to, to overcome healthcare provider denial that injection errors happen all too easily, we incorporated risk communication principles to develop uh, the It's Real, It's Recent, It Could co Become Your Problem flyer in the upper right, which included headlines from real newspaper stories about real incidents of, of healthcare worker error, provider error. The lower right shows us <coughs> the set of our public health live webcast, our New York State Public Health Grand Rounds equivalent uh, on syringe safety. Uh, Public Health Live uh, reaches about 5,800 providers in 1,600 locations and is even picked up internationally. For the general public, the message has been aimed at getting people to, who are about to go undergo minor uh, surgical procedures or injections to ask their health care provider about syringe safety precautions they will take. Following the recent hepatitis C outbreak in New Hampshire, I promoted this message in an interview on our local NPR health show in, in the lower left. Uh, which is nationally syndicated, and the program was picked up in 180 U.S. cities. The New York campaign has also provided mentorship and technical assistance to other jurisdictions, including a CME presentation for 100 physicians at a Rhode Island hospital, uh, and we've also pre presented at the Northeast Epi uh, Conference to uh, health departments from the, the eight northeastern states, and it provided uh, assistance to other states in developing either invest their investigations or developing campaign efforts. So in conclusion, healthcare-associated bloodborne pathogen transmission occurs more often than realized. Uh, active surveillance and follow-up investigations will uncover previously undetected transmissions. Standardized and collaborative investigations are necessary but are resource-intensive. Providers need to be educated and their denial addressed to raise awareness of de uh, and decrease risk, and patients should be encouraged to ask their provider about bloodborne pathogen safety as part of increased patient involvement overall in uh, medical decision making. So again, thanks very much, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'm here representing CMS, the single largest, or largest purchaser of health care in the United States and probably the world, purchasing more than $800 billion worth of health care every year. But I'm also here representing a public health agency 
that seeks to be a trustworthy partner in the promotion of healthcare innovation, in promoting the adoption and spread of uh, useful information and best practices, and promoting the consistent advancement of safety and quality of care. And increasingly, we seek to align our various capabilities and tools in the same direction for using our payment policy, for example, to advance value-based purchasing, for increasing quality measurement and uh, transparency to the public, for increasing collaboration with the CDC and other agencies, for increasing technical assistance to the quality improvement organizations, the dialysis uh, facility networks, and most recently, the healthcare engagement uh, networks and through direct inspection of quality of care and safety through the survey and certification process in partnership with states and accrediting organizations. So today I would like to focus on the survey and certification activities in support of injection safety and infection control. But first, a little background. Before most providers can participate in Medicare and Medicaid, they are required to demonstrate that they meet basic public expectations for safety and quality of care. And they do this in part through an on-site, unannounced survey conducted by trained, objective individuals who assess their degree of compliance with what we call the conditions of coverage or conditions for participation in uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Examples of such regula regulated providers are ambulatory surgical centers, clinical laboratories, dialysis facilities, hospitals of all types, nursing homes, rural health clinics, home health agencies, and many others. So we have a variety of functions with survey and certification, beginning with the surveys and then the certification, but we are also backed up by tremendous authority to require that if there are health care problems or safety problems, that those problems are remedied uh, promptly and uh, effectively. So for a provider that's already participating in Medicare, if there are serious problems, they may be required to file a plan of correction, and they may have a revisit to verify that the remedial action that they have undertaken has restored them to full compliance with the Medicare and Medicaid conditions of coverage or conditions for participation. Infection control in ambulatory care settings represents a very significant challenge for a number of reasons. Um, first, they are large in number. They exist in many diverse and dispersed settings. There are great differences in their size, scope, complexity of practice. There's a high prevalence of the for-profit business model, and they are the fastest growing facilities in terms of number amongst all Medicare participating providers and suppliers. So one form of ambulatory care setting is ambulatory surgical centers. And here in this slide, you can see the tremendous growth in those facilities from 3,094 in fiscal year 2000 to 5,368 in fiscal year 2011, a 74.4% uh, increase over that uh, time period. In terms of measuring their quality of care and safety relative to infection control, we of course have the condition for coverage that they maintain an ongoing infection con control program, that they adhere to professional standards such as those promulgated by the CDC, that they have a designated qualified infection con control professional, and that they implement nationally recognized infection control guidelines that are integrated into a second important condition for coverage, and that is the QAPI requirement, the requirement that every ambulatory surgical center maintain an effectively functioning quality assessment and performance improvement system that continuously streams performance information back to the individuals who can and will use that information to improve quality and to prevent recurrence of any adverse events that have occurred. Another type of ambulatory care setting that's quite important relative to infection control is dialysis facilities or end-stage renal disease facilities. Here in this slide, you can see again a, a tremendous rate of growth for this particular type of ambulatory care setting 
from 3,957 in fiscal year 2000 to 5,006 in fiscal year 2011. So again, we have a number of important conditions for coverage that apply to dialysis facilities, the infection control requirements, with one difference from ambulatory surgical centers. Here, with the dialysis facilities, we built into the regulation that they apply not only nationally recognized standards, but that they adhere to the CDC guidelines in specific. We also have the QAPI requirement applicable to dialysis facilities and an additional requirement that's important for infection control, the requirement that each dialysis, dialysis facility actively participate in the ESRD technical assistance network and that they act on network recommendations. The challenge of infection control is larger than any one agency or provider. Fortunately, there's a great array of federal agencies and state agencies that are dedicated to improving infection control as well as professional societies. One of our challenges is aligning all of our various capabilities in the same direction so that we can be most effective. This next slide is simply my very feeble attempt to make this simple point more memorable. And the point is, is this. Our best prospect for success in any large-scale national endeavor is in, in aligning the actions and authoritative expertise of the major actors in pursuit of that goal. So borrowing from the astronomical term for the alignment of celestial bodies, when we have such zizigy, we will have synergy. We will have a situation in which the total is indeed greater than the sum of its parts. So let's see how this works in particular between CMS and the CDC. We each basically have strengths and struggles and we're a perfect match in that regard. CMS has a tremendous on-site presence uh, conducting on-site inspections in each of those facilities that I described earlier. Um, we have tremendous enforcement authority to require that identified problems be remedied, but we don't have the same scientific basis and up-to-date expertise of the CDC, and the CDC offers that. Similarly, the CDC has tremendous guidance, uh, but sometimes has difficulty motivating the poorer performers to come to the table and make use of that guidance. Well, CMS has great motivating ability. And between us, we are stronger. So let's see how this worked out in a particular case, the case that Dr. Burke had just mentioned, the Nevada outbreak of hepatitis C in 2008. And in that experience, the CDC and CMS came together and the CDC helped us develop a special surveyor worksheet that the surveyors took on site and helped us conduct uh, training for the surveyors so that they could better identify lapses in infection control. And from that 2008 experience in Nevada, we then recruited three volunteer states to take these worksheets and enlarge the enterprise by selecting a number of uh, ambulatory surgical centers and a stratified random sample in those three states to get a better sense of whether or not the Nevada experience was more typical of, of other states. And what we found uh, in this case is indeed uh, the results were quite alarming. In this three-state pilot of 68 randomly selected ambulatory surgical centers, almost 68% had infection control lapses and 57% of, uh, of those uh, ambulatory surgical centers were cited for some form of deficiency in relationship to the conditions for coverage and infection control. And of that total, um, the, the topic of today, the injection safety and the multi-use, uh, multi-patient use of single-use uh, vials uh, loomed quite large. The results of these uh, um, uh, the pilot were published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2010, and the results so impressed uh, the edit editorial board that they put forward an editorial that basically said that this risk was not acceptable and must be corrected immediately and definitively if the three state pilot results were generalizable. So we wanted to know for sure if the results were indeed 
generalizable. So we went forth in 2010 and expanded this to all states. And we again randomly selected ambulatory surgical centers, about a third of all ambulatory, ambulatory surgical centers in each state. And unfortunately, the results were similarly alarming. Uh, in that year, 2010, 51 percent of the ambulatory surgical centers were found to have um, deficiencies compared to the 57 percent in the three-state uh, pilot. Now I'm, I'm pleased to say that that number is improving a little bit. We made this infection control worksheet and the improved survey process a standard part of every ambulatory surgical center survey beginning in 2011. And once we did that, it triggered the requirement that the CMS approved accrediting organizations such as the Joint Commission do likewise. In 2011, we found that the number had dropped down a little bit to 43% and down to 42% in 2012, um, still much too high but improving. In any partnership, one thing tends to lead to another, and uh, we took this experience and determined that uh, we could make better inroads as well in the hospital environment, and so the CDC, again, helped us uh, adapt an infection control worksheet for the more complex set of environments uh, in hospitals, and uh, we did the same thing with the QAPI area and also discharge planning insofar as it is a department-wide goal to reduce healthcare-associated conditions by 40% in hospitals and reduce um, um, unnecessary 30-day hospital readmissions by 20%, and infections, again, represent an important source of both healthcare-associated conditions for hospitals and readmissions. So we included discharge planning as a special tool. We piloted those instruments in 2010, and we're going forward in 2013 with a somewhat different approach. We're starting with an educational approach where the infection control worksheet expanded and adapted for the hospital setting is used as a risk management tool that we hope hospitals will use to improve their practices. And the surveyors are conducting surveys, but at the exit conference, instead of a description of potential def uh, deficiency citations, the surveyors will describe the degree of risk that they perceive explain the types of risk, and encourage the hospital to use the infection control worksheet on their own for their own internal and hopefully more frequent self-assessments. And we hope that the hospitals in particular will use the tools in their QAPI uh, processes, and eventually we expect that those worksheets will become part of a standard uh, process later. I hope that this overview and, and this particular case example is useful to you as you think about ways in which we can coordinate our mutual agency talents and capabilities in the advancement of the safety and quality agenda. One area in which we might do so is in figuring out ways to get more knowledge and training to the front lines, especially to the front lines of the ASC staff. And for those providers who seem to have serious or repeated problems, uh, since we have the authority to require plans of correction, we might collaborate more in figuring out ways in which directed plans of correction that include key elements that we think are, are instrumental, uh, we might incorporate those into, into a standard template. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll leave you with the assertion that uh, aligning our capabilities is one of the best things that we can do and that syzygy is more than just a good Scrabble word and note in the process that I think I have just elevated the CDC to the uh, status of a celestial body where it probably belongs. <laughs> so it's appropriate at this time for me to convey uh, a special thanks to the many talents in CDC who've worked so closely with us in the past few years to generate far more progress in infection control than I thought possible. Thank you, and now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bell, who you know very well. Um, hi, everybody. By way of wrap-up, I'd like to start by thanking our three speakers, uh, not only for their excellent presentations, but uh, for actually being here despite recovery efforts that are ongoing from the recent hurricane and I'm sure countless other public health crises uh, that, are, that are underway. Thank you. Um, what I'd also like to thank them for is, is focusing on, on this particular issue. It is not cutting-edge science. Um, it, is, it is not... 
uh, terribly uh, fun to think about. It is, in fact, in, in fact appalling. I, I think you'll agree that the fact that in the United States in 2012, you have a 50-50 chance of being exposed to an infection if you go to an ambulatory surgery center based on what you just saw. A, a coin toss is not the kind of healthcare quality that we expect in this country. I think that if you extend what we heard today to the broader area of public health in general, a couple of our major thrusts uh, are, are, are clearly threatened by an inability to rely on safe care when it comes to injections. Think about immunizations. Think about what we say about immunizations being so incredibly valuable to public health. If you add hepatitis to the immunization, you've undermined an incredibly important tool. Think about cancer screening. If we're telling people that next year you need to go for your 50-year-old colonoscopy, um, but you have a, a reasonable chance of being given contaminated propofol and leaving with hepatitis C. This is not a good message to be sending uh, to, the, to the people of this country. Uh, so I think that even though it is appalling and, and the, the, the work seems overwhelming, the fact that we as a, as a nation uh, at the state health department level and across the federal government are focusing on this uh, is, is very, very important. I think though that despite the strides that have been made with ambulatory surgery centers, and they are substantial, um, I think you heard just now that by combining what we know about infection prevention with the activity of surveyors on the ground, we've been able to make a, a substantial change in, in how things are done. This is very good, and the 5,000 and growing ambulatory surgery centers are a big and important target. But what about the 16,000 nursing homes where injections take place? What about the dialysis centers? What about the oncology infusion centers? There are thousands and thousands of additional places that deserve similar attention. The uncounted private physician's offices where injections take place, essentially unmonitored. This is a huge mountain of work that remains to be done. And until it's accomplished, um, I, I find it very concerning. Uh, frankly, I'm, I'm anxious when I get my annual flu shot. Um, I love getting it here at CDC because the people who give it to me are doing it the right way in front of me. Um, I had it once at a pharmacy because I was traveling out of the country and didn't have time to get it here. And the pharmacist disappeared into the inner sanctum and came back with a syringe. And I, I seriously thought about asking. Um, I, I didn't because I was in a hurry. Um, <laughs> but I shouldn't have to feel that way. And, and so it, it, Joe Purs mentioned a couple of E's. He mentioned EPI, which is close to our hearts. He mentioned education and enforcement. Education and enforcement are critical, without a doubt. But clearly, even, even with the added focus, they're not always enough. Uh, and so as, as you think about questions and comments that you might have for, for, for our, our panel today, um, I'd like to tee it off with maybe a question for one or more of you, which is, what about the additional ease? Are there engineering solutions? Can we design things that prevent individuals from making these mistakes? Uh, what about economic uh, strategies? Are there ways in which the way we pay for care can be used to make it less and less likely that these for-profit organizations are going to uh, prioritize the, the, the cost benefit of reusing something over the safety for the patient. Joe, do you want to take a stab at the engineering, maybe? Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, um, the idea that, you know, prevention, you know, will take, um, you know, other approaches and, and, and pushing on different levers, including engineering. You know, the idea of building a safer system you know, from the ground up, you know, is appealing. Making, um, making uh, injection delivery more foolproof, if you will, is important. And, you know, an example of that is, you know, we talked about um, the, the risks related to narcotics tampering. Um, you know, this is a, this is a serious um, and underappreciated risk. And um, in very large multi-state outbreaks that we've investigated and been affected by in the last couple of years, um, Technicians who don't have primary access to the narcotic have been able to actually swap a decoy syringe for a syringe that you know has been dr drawn up for the patient, and it shouldn't be so easy to pull the wool over the eyes of you know people working in these cases in hospital outpatient departments. Um, you should be able to tell a used syringe apart from an unused syringe, and um, you're thinking too that you know really if syringe reuse is you know at, at the root of much of the. Um, 
uh, I wanted to say evil. I guess I'll say it. <laughs> the, the harm that you know we're witnessing. Um, you know, what about auto disable syringe technologies? That's something that we promoted in the international settings for years now to you know maintain the safety of our immunization program. So thinking more about uh, engineering solutions, I think um, you know has a, a lot of good potential. I think on the, on the economic side, of course, there are some extremes in which uh, CMS, for example, has said, no, we're not going to pay for the added cost of complications and, and so on. But there's also a danger in, in getting too specific in, in these economic uh, levers. And I think that's partly why um, we, we're looking at the QAPI requirements and trying to bolster that, which is another sort of E, it's human factors engineering. And, and basically what we're trying to do there is be the external champions of the people inside the organization who are striving mightily to improve safety precautions and adopt protocols, no matter what they are, um, enge engineering or education or uh, any of the other E's that uh, we want to be the ones that are cheering them on and basically calling attention of top management, the CEO, for example, to, uh, to the need to have those people reinforced and supported. I think I'll just come back to the idea that healthcare providers really need to appreciate uh, that this is a risk. I think we've experienced uh, in, in, for example, our required infection control course that we offer in New York that providers, providers uh, uh, <clears throat> come and sit in the front row and open up the newspaper sort of in disdain of the message that like this is too elementary. On the other hand, we see providers doing stupid things every day. We had a, a physician drop a, a, a 10-dose vial of flu vaccine into one syringe and go down the line of his employees, changing the needle but using the same syringe. And so it's a little hard to, to understand uh, how to get that message across, but to overcome this sort of denial I think is, is a big challenge because if providers really understand the principles and think they wouldn't, they wouldn't do these things. Go ahead. Well, I was going to just add that I think <clears throat> with the multi-dose vial issue, I think there may be some of these drugs may be expensive and there may be some economic incentive to, to use a, a, a single dose vial on more than one patient and I think we need to figure out how to overcome that, that kind of an issue. But other than that, I think it's really educational and it's not even educational, it's getting the providers to buy in that there's even a problem here. And I was just going to say that that sense of needing to do the right thing brings us to the, you know, the E for ethics, you know, back to the first do no harm principle, you know, so not letting the, uh, the economics override the ethical imperative. Thank you. Um, are there questions or comments from Envision? Hearing none, I, I, I'll solicit questions or comments from our audience today. Dr. Cardo. Um, so if it looks so simple, <laughs> and so why it's not happening? Who does not agree with us? Because I know there are groups that don't agree with us. Can you comment on that? I'll try. Yeah, it's, it has been somewhat surprising that, you know, um, some of the uh, guidance which we take as almost self-evident um, has been challenged in some corners um, in, in recent times. And for example, you know, the, the notion that a single dose vial, you know, is only for single patient use, you know, that's, that's, um, that's sort of inherent in the FDA approval of that label. That is the expectation, and yet, you know, we were asked this year by um, persons in the pain physician community um, to, you know, basically prove, you know, that there is risk of harm. You know, the, what we get a lot of times are what we have referred to as the big ifs. You know, if I only access that vial, you know, with a new needle and a new syringe and my fingers crossed behind my back and so on and so forth, you know, then prove to me that that's bad. And, um, and that's challenging. So, um, you know, we do have um, some way to go, I would say, in terms of, you know, meeting the provider denial issue. But also it speaks to um, the need to get that right-sized, you know, uh, medication in a ready-to-deliver format. Because the more that we can take, to the extent that we can move 
preparation, you know, sort of upstream to say the manufacturing realm um, where there are tighter controls in terms of maintaining sterility, um, you know, we, we, we might all benefit. So I'll just take the liberty of adding that even though we have encouraged private clinicians to look to compounding pharmacies for appropriate packaging of, of smaller doses, as you're well aware, that's not always a perfect fix either. So the, the word that Joe used, manufacturing, where there are actual standards for post post packaging sterility testing and so on, that's more the direction that we're looking at at this point. I think that regardless of where it's done, what we want to see is that medications are handled correctly and, and without contamination. Um, and when we think about engineering, it's not just syringes that we're talking about. Also the, the facility that's used for preparing medications. Um, right now the standards that exist point towards a very high-tech hospital pharmacy something that doesn't exist for most ambulatory surgery centers and certainly not for most private clinical offices. Uh, but could there be something built that is designed to prevent contamination? Um, imagine a small plexiglass unit that bolts to the wall in the hallway where it's away from the chaos of clinical care, less prone to confusion, mislabeling, uh, but still provides a, a level of safety. I think creative solutions like that are probably on the horizon as well. Uh, last clip. Yes, please. We have a question from one of our Twitter followers. What is the rule for multi-dose vials of vaccines, for example, flu vaccines? Do you discard after 28 days or follow the expiration date? Okay, sure. So that's an example of where um, you know, manufacturers um, typically have submitted data to um, demonstrate that the sterility of the product can be maintained um, beyond 28 days. So when that um, kind of data was, has not been submitted to FDA, then we'll use um, a 28-day default. Um, and again, you know, multi-dose files can be used safely for multiple patients, but it does require really careful attention to the whole you know, um, suite of safe injection practices to maintain the sterility of that product. Last call for questions. In that case, thank you very much, gentlemen. I'd like to uh, thank all of our uh, speakers uh, for their contributions to today's Grand Rounds. Uh, please join us in uh, five weeks for the December session on uh, public health and disability. <laughs>